I think we have so many good authors nowadays for children. I have grandchildren who are, um, well, varying ages, but when I think back to when I was eight and such an avid reader, two of my grandchildren are similar ages, and they absolutely love books. So by example, we can encourage them, but I think also because there are so many modern authors who keep in touch with children of today. I mean, in the days of Enid Blyton where everybody wore shorts and smiled and behaved themselves, they've gone. I mean, now we have slightly more realistic children who have got, and the books have got humour. And I think that's what gets the, the children gripped nowadays. Amos Medra. Val Nell's author of the book, A Darkly Bound Betrayal. A very warm welcome to you. Thank you so much for joining us. How are you today? I'm good, thanks, Amos, and thank you for inviting me. You're welcome. It's great to have you here. Uh, you know, Val, reading up on your story, you know, you, you're you someone who always wanted to write a book, but that didn't come until later on, you know, life uh, takes over and you've got other priorities and, you know, being a mother, of course, to wonderful children, which you speak so proudly about. Mm-hmm. And of course, you know, I'm sure you wouldn't change that for anything. And now you've written this book. Uh, you know, did you ever think you'll get to this point? Did you ever think this book would ever be written? To be honest, Amos, I didn't. And in fact, my youngest son, um, he wrote on the manuscript, the book that must be finished. And that was quite some time ago, actually. Um, and I, I actually never thought I would finish. I couldn't find an ending, basically. So it sat on the shelf, gathering dust. <laughs> and that's really interesting. So talk to us, why did you finally get to the stage where you said, right, that's it, enough is enough, let's get this done? Well, it was basically, oh, sorry, my phone. At the start of lockdown, Obviously, all our lives changed and we weren't able to do the things that we normally do. Normally, I'm out taking photographs with my husband. We we take wildlife photographs, darling murmurations, things like that, sunsets, sunrises. A lot of that we couldn't do. So at the start of lockdown, I was a little bit empty. I'm sure lots of people were. And I just happened to find the manuscript on the shelf. And I thought, hey, I've got an ending. And suddenly the ending which was actually the beginning of the book, came to me. But of course, I'd actually written the book quite some time ago. I had to rewrite the whole thing because it didn't quite add up completely. Uh, So that was my project during lockdown. I rewrote the book and never thought I'd even get it published, but I did. So that was the next exciting event. And, and, And that's it, isn't it? Because this book, you know, this project that you've been working on for a long time, didn't quite have that ending that you wanted it to have. But then again, it was just that time during long time lockdown, yeah. being able to finally put it together. Was it an epiphany or was it intentional? I think it was an epiphany, to be honest. And it's also been an inspiration. Now I'm halfway through writing a sequel. So, you know, it was just something I never dreamt I'd really ever do. But of course, it's all time consuming. <laughs> <laughs> so talk to us about the book itself. What can the reader, ex- reader expect? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a thriller. It's a psychological thriller. It's a novel, a psychological thriller. Um, it's mainly, I live in Somerset now, although I have roots in the north. Um, it's mainly based in Somerset. Um, it's, set, it's set, a lot of the action takes place in the 90s. We have flashbacks to the 60s. Um, It's exploring the grief of a girl, Anna, whose father is murdered. And we follow her down the path as she tries to understand how her mild-mannered father could get murdered. And suspicion falls upon her brother, who disappears. And we explore the relationships between people as Anna herself tries to come to an understanding of what's happened and why her father came to this rather brutal end. Wow, sounds absolutely fascinating. I mean, that is very gripping. You just want to know what happens next. You know, was it the brother? Who was it? (laughs) Exactly. And what are the secrets in her past? As Anna starts this journey to 
well, it, it's an epiphany for her, actually. She starts this journey and she discovers dark family secrets. Um, we have, well, we have a trip to Russia at one point, so not modern day Russia. Uh, this is back in the 60s. So hopefully it keeps the reader gripped and wants to find out what, what's actually happening. Sounds uh, like there's a lot of... Uh... Uh, espionage involved in this as well mm, just a little <laughs> just a tad yes yes <laughs> what was daddy up to <laughs> exactly exactly you've got it on the we can't say anymore we'll, we'll spoil the plot <laughs> wow sounds really interesting now let's go back to your own personal life uh you know yep. you loved reading you were an avid reader from a very oh. young age um yep. you know reading your dad's books and uh sci-fi books and yep you know, that got you very much into reading. Um, you know, did, talk to us about those early days and, you know, getting into reading itself. To be honest, as soon as I could read, I just read anything. Totally inappropriate. As you say, I read my father's sci sci-fi books. As, as in, I mean, an eight-year-old reading those, I don't suppose I understood any of it, really. I just read whatever I could put my hands on. Georgia Hare, science fiction books, anything. And... I just walked about with books in my hand and I still do I can't if I start a book I can't put it down it's just compulsive and now of course I just I just love all sorts of books but I think possibly crime thrillers have become my favorites now which is why I've written one myself in this day and age that we're living where children have got tablets and social media and all these distractions we find that, you know, we're tr having to do campaigns to try and encourage children to read. Mm -hmm. How can we face these challenges and how can we encourage children to pick up a book? Not because we told them to pick a book, because of that same interest that you had as a child. I think we have so many good authors nowadays for children. I have grandchildren who are um, well, varying ages, but when I think back to when I was eight and such an avid reader, two of my grandchildren are similar ages, and they absolutely love books. So by example, we can encourage them, but I think also because there are so many modern authors who keep in touch with children of today. I mean, in the days of Enid Blyton where everybody wore shorts and smiled and behave themselves they've gone I mean now we have slightly more realistic children who have got and, and the books have got humor and I think that's what gets the, the children gripped nowadays you know I, I don't know David Williams Michael uh, I can't pronounce his surname actually Mapago I'm not sure how you pronounce it but I know those are two authors that my grandchildren they read the books and they absolutely love them yeah, indeed. And yes, they do like tablets. They do like tablets as well, I have to say, but we also do a lot of absolute <laughs> reading. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, you know, just reflecting back on my own childhood, you know, I used to love going to the library. And oh, yes. Mobile libraries as well, you know, when that would come at the end of your street. Mm. Straight in there and, you know, picking up the latest book and it was such a, such a joy and you just, you know, just find yourself lost in this world and you're just reading away uh, i think it know. is and it, it it you open a book and the print the print's there in front of you and you get absorbed in the story and suddenly it's not a book is it you're in in a world you're in an adventure and you're following you know you're following the adventure of the people inside that book i just i think it's amazing yeah, absolutely and again, just, you know, this is what we should try and encourage, in my opinion, you know, children yes. to get back into. Uh, of course, the tablets are great. They've got their place. Uh, but there's nothing, I mean, even just the turning of pages and that smell of a book. <laughs> you cannot be. It's the smell. Yeah, the smell of the book. <laughs> it's just, just the whole thing, the feel of it. It's yeah. just so important. Yeah. Mm. So lockdown came. You put this yep. book together. And... Uh, Talk, talk to us about the story, getting that out to publishers, getting it published. How did that all go for you? Well, at first, I had no idea. Um, and I came across this site that said you can self-publish. But to self-publish, I didn't self-publish just myself. I went through a, a website and they put it on Amazon for you. Um, 
And then my friends read it and it was called actually a different name then. It was called The Darkly Joined Betrayal. So I got it on Amazon and my friends read it and people liked it. So a lot of people liked it. And then it just went, that's it, nothing. And of course, it's very difficult to promote it because, well, I had no clue to be honest. I don't think a lot of people do. And then I had the idea for a sequel. I thought, well, I can't write the sequel because you have to read the first one. So I thought if I get it republished, but get it published in bookshops so that people can actually have a book in their hand rather than look at it as an e-book. So I did find somebody who would cramp up Milner who agreed to publish it for me. So we went down that route. They did a complete proofread of it, a reproof. It became a darkly bound betrayal. And I published it under Val Knowles, which was my earlier name, um, but it's also my children's name, which is more exciting. And suddenly it is out there now. It's on the bookshelves. It's it's a real book. And that's so much more exciting. It's on Amazon as well, obviously. <laughs> Everything is nowadays, isn't it? But um, it's now a proper book you can have in your hand and open the pages and look at. And you spoke so eloquently about what we can expect in the book without giving too much away and it sounds to me that there might be a sequel am yes. I saying that <laughs> there is a sequel which I'm working on again it's going to be based primarily in Somerset because that's what I know the most that's what I know the best there's slightly different um, angles to the sequel and I promise you, it won't take as long as the first one did. <laughs> so <laughs> nobody's going to be needing to write on it, but it's finding the time really to get onto it. And I really must do that and get it finished. And no better place than Somerset itself, you know, setting the scene as well. Talk to us about that when you try and create the scene for the audience. Do you p pick out particular landmarks? Is there a time in the season, a time in the year, a particular season? That you pick out well as you say Somerset is beautiful and um, because we actually live in Glastonbury now it starts on Glastonbury tour so there we have sort of the iconic symbolism symbol of Glastonbury so that's where the sequel starts um it moves on it explores the characters of the first book, The Darkly Bound Betrayal, as it's called The Hex, the second books, which might give you a clue that it's not quite as simple as... <laughs> um, which is actually based on the fact that one of the shops in Glastonbury used to have a sign inside it. I don't know whether it still has. It used to have, and it said, shoplifters will not be prosecuted. They will have a hex put on them. And that's what gave me the inspiration for the title. Um, I've forgotten where I was now. <laughs> so, yes, it follows... The, say, the life of the characters in the first book as they grow and develop. And it also has um, a foreign element. So um, we continue the, the Russian theme. Obviously, I'm not a fan of Russia and I know no one is. And it's not a sympathetic um, uh, aspect to that side. It's just part of the book and part of how I want the plot to develop. Yeah. I mean, again, you know, I can sense espionage and so many cloak and dagger and so many secret meetings in that uh, <laughs> I hope Westminster doesn't uh, uh, turn up at some point in this does it <laughs> <laughs> you'll have to read the book Amos <laughs> okay. wow it sounds exciting so the book is out now you said it's available uh yes by Cranthorpe Miller uh it's, yes. it's available in all book good bookshops it is. It's incredibly difficult um, to anybody who's thinking about doing this. It seems so simple, but it's incredibly difficult to get it onto bookshelves. The publishers do as much as they can. Um, we've trolled around some of the local bookshops. You know, would you please put this on your shelf? But obviously everybody has a budget and, you know, you've got to persuade them. So hopefully it's available. Certainly it should be available, even if it's not actually in stock, if places like WH Smith or... Waterstones, you can order it from there if it's not actually on the shelves. So it is out there and it's on Amazon and <laughs> hopefully in some of the local bookshops in Bath as well. Fantastic. Wow, Val, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure speaking to you and just to hear your story and uh, this wonderful book that is just going to make, you know, that it's, it's already out there. You know, people yeah. get out there, buy this book, 
and uh, really enjoy it. And we can expect the sequel to be coming out very soon too. Hopefully, yeah, hopefully. <laughs> Watch this space. Well, Val, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for your time today. And thank you for inviting me, Amos. It's been lovely to talk to you. You're Thanks. Welcome. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. If you want some amazing inspiration, check out the videos next to me, and I'll see you right there.